movie adaptations are uh, amazingly popular. I think you say something like 85% of all Oscar-winning best pictures are adaptations, 90% uh, of all uh, mini television, mini series, of course. Apart from the hunger for material, why do you think that is? That this. You know how children love to have stories told to them again and again and again, read to them again and again? I think that there is something about this pleasure of a familiar story that we like and enjoy, but seeing it in a slightly different way and seeing it in new ways, I think there's really something to that, that, that sameness but difference that comes in. Storytelling is an integral human urge that has been trained to pass on information and emotions through generations. As one of the oldest forms of storytelling, literature has influenced and led the way to the arts that came after it. The youngest of the arts, cinema, has had a love-hate relationship with its predecessor. Literature's impact on cinema has been controversial since the invention of the latter. Before diving into genres and themes, it is vital to understand how the relationship between literature and cinema came about. Filmmaker and film theorist Sergei Eisenstein argued in 1944 that the American cinema sprung from the Victorian novel tradition in its attention to visual detail, empirical psychology, atmospheric close-ups, alternating omniscient and character viewpoints, and shifts from one group of characteristic to another, all shaped Western film techniques, which in turn influenced and shaped film art more generally. The relationship between cinema and literature is more than just an influence, but more so a transformation. The Victorian novel turned into film, and the path of the novel proceeded in another channel, both in structure and in cultural shape. From afar, a natural relationship seemed to have flourished between literature and cinema. So many films were based on best-selling novels. Said novels acquired financial gain from those adaptations, and the literary terminology was employed by filmmakers to define filmmaking. However, in reality, the issue of adaptation stirred up opposing ideas over the ability of cinema to adapt the works of literature. <laughs> George Bluestone, the first person to properly address adaptation as a theory, characterized the tie between the two arts as overtly compatible, secretly hostile. Marginalized by both of the practices, film adaptation of literature is seen as a hybrid form that is bastardized like no other. Although adaptation as a concept is a common practice in the history of arts under the pseudonym of borrowing, based on a book for some reason sounds blasphemous when it comes next to a film, but not when it is, for example, a painting. Although the transformation of one text into another is common among all arts, film adaptations of literary works are still on their way to prove themselves in the eyes of the public. The terms used when describing film adaptations range from infidelity and deformation to betrayal and violation, hinting that adapting a literary work to film is like a treason to the art of literature. Adaptation analysis has mostly been carried out by critics from an English literature perspective, meaning that they tended to prioritize the literary text over the adaptation. Therefore, they prefer the slow and subjectively more troublesome process of reading over the instantly satisfactory and seemingly easier to consume pleasure of film. Gabriel Miller argues that the novel's characters undergo a simplification process when transferred to the screen, for film is not very successful in dealing either with complex psychological states or with dream or memory, nor can it render thought. His ignorance on the formal and narrative structures of cinema led him to conclude that literature is somehow better at manifesting inner judgments and desires and psychological traumas. In the same way, Bluestone also notes that the film, having only arrangements of space to work with, cannot render thought, for the moment the thought is externalized, it is no longer thought. The same could easily be said of theater, but these critics seem to be overlooking that. On stage, every thought has to be externalized as well. One could easily claim that Shakespeare was unable to create deep characters. Art forms besides literature tend to lean more on subtle, inferable thought based on mannerisms, metaphors, and symbols. Just because they're not openly written down does not mean they're any less profound. Cinema has its own merits in conveying inner struggles of human life, not only through dialogue and the actor's performance, but through color, production design, cinematography, framing, pacing, sound, and music. The question to be asked here is why literature superiority taken for granted? Thomas Leach says, entrenched representational forms have always greeted new rivals with a suspicion amounting to hostility, especially if economic power is at stake, as it was in the rise of the novel as a predominant mode of entertainment for the rising middle class two centuries ago. 
After the noted popularity of the novel in the Victorian era, where it was the entertainment equivalent of television, cinema swooped in as the entertainment novelty of the public. With a new film came a new film theater, and the popularity of cinema grew and grew, whereas literature began to acquire an idealized status. This vastly gained popularity was partly due to cinema's appeal to the masses, which resulted in cinema's belittlement and lack of prestige as most mass-addressing popular arts encounter, compared to literature, which was regarded more subtle and precise, since it allegedly demanded a kind of intellectual effort from its readers that film did not require from its spectators. <laughs> Cinema can said to be degraded by the company it kept, and this class problem also contributed to its already lower status. Adaptations were deemed even worse, since they were seen as the dumbed-down versions of high literary works, fit for an audience that is vulgar enough to prefer cotton candy of entertainment to the gourmet delights of literature. Traditionally speaking, purity in the formation of an art has been better valued than hybridity. Therefore, in their eternal rivalry, cinema and literature were pitted against their semiotic and aesthetic purity. At this point, Robert Stamm argues that the superiority of literature to its film adaptation comes from a historical anteriority and seniority, the assumption that is, the older arts are necessarily better arts. He claims that arts gain prestige with the passing of time, hence the art of literature inherently surpasses the recent art of cinema. Here, literature profits from a double priority, the general historical priority of literature to cinema and the specific priority of novels to their adaptations. Thus, the hybridity of the adaptation turns into a double disadvantage. They're not only the copies of their source material, but they're also less of films. Since adaptations are not as pure and original, they lack representational fluency on their own grounds. This inferiority caused by a lack of originality argument is funny, if one considers the case of William Shakespeare, almost all of whose plays were adaptations of earlier texts. That said, whatever Shakespeare did is generally viewed favorably in the eyes of the critics. According to his defenders, the originality of Shakespeare lies in his ability to find a gem, to detect a valuable source material and transform it into a masterpiece. For them, he is not an adapter per se, but an alchemist. It is not only canonical literary figures who are immune to the title of the adapter either. The likes of Orson Welles and Stanley Kubrick, and most notably Walt Disney, seem to have full ownership of their adaptations under the guise of authorism. However, better adaptations are still adaptations. What really matters seems to be the success of the product in the eyes of the public. When the adaptation is successful, there is no discussion of the faithfulness of the work to the source text. If the film succeeds on its own merit, it ceases to be problematic. But isn't an adaptation a new form for the source story to feed on and survive? And more importantly, is it possible for the story, the essence, to exist in a virgin state, free from any mode of expression that can be transformed well into another state of existence? This is a significant question to think about, considering the fact that adaptation discourse revolves around the idea of fidelity to this so-called essence. This idea claims that there is a set in stone story out of all contexts which materialized itself in the art of literature, and it is the adapter's duty to carry over that story intact to the medium of cinema. Any film that fails to do so, which is called an unfaithful film, is unsuccessful. This approach obviously ignores that not all features of a literary work are adaptable to the medium of film. Apart from the idea of fidelity, which I will be discussing later, the comparison between the two arts start with their distinct matter of expression and form. When the content is seemingly similar, as in the case of a film adaptation and a book, their structural differences stand out. Umberto Eco says that literature and cinema are both arts of action. The former is narrated and the latter represented. Each art form has uniquely particular norms and capabilities of expression, which is basically the concept known as medium specificity. Robert Sam outlines each art's formal differences in the track format, as literature having only one, but cinema having five tracks. According to Stam, literature consists of language whose matter of expression is writing, while cinema has moving photographic image, recorded phonetic sound, recorded noises, recorded musical sound, and writing. An adapter's duty is to take what is written in a one-track medium and transform it into a format where five different tracks will be in motion all at once. 
As mentioned earlier, the concept of fidelity is a dead end that adaptations of literary works cannot seem to escape. If the film adaptation is faithful to the source, it is deemed unoriginal, uncreative, and lazy. If it is unfaithful, then it is being disrespectful. There starts the conundrum. Besides, what does faithful even mean? The idea of a true, faithful adaptation is observed as everyone who reads a novel reads it through their own internal wants, fears and dilemmas and envisions a different version in their minds, which by definition is a subjective version. Therefore, when someone says, I thought the book was better, it actually means that what they imagined in their mind was better than that of the directors. Fidelity criticism depends on the notion of the text having a single correct meaning, which the filmmaker has either adhered to or in some sense violated, therefore suggesting that a good adaptation should be an exact translation. The less difference there is between the two texts, the better. In this sense, the best adaptation would be the repetition of the same source material, which would be unnecessary. Why should time, money and energy be wasted if the final result is replicating what was done before? Would anyone even bother adapting a text into a film when they have nothing new, interesting or personal to say about it? If the best adaptation is as close to the source material as possible, is a reprint of the same work the best adaptation? Was Psycho the same as Psycho really? Let alone the creative differences in which filmmakers might differ from the author of the novel, filmmaking is an utterly different art form than literature. While writing only takes a pen and paper, films are a lot more expensive and toilsome. Therefore, an author might write free of any budgetary constraints, as those get involved later on in the distribution process, whereas a film's existence depends on money all the way through. To quote Rubber Stamp, While it costs nothing for a novelist to write, the Marquis left Versailles Palace at 5pm on a cold and wintry day in January 1763. The filmmaker requires substantial sums in order to stage, for example, a simulacral Paris, or to shoot on locations, to dress the actors in period costume and so forth. In this sense, fidelity becomes an unpractical as well as undesirable, for not everything written on the page that sounds good would look the same on screen. Apart from financial aspects, filmmaking involves more people who make choices in the production, unlike literature, where usually a single individual is responsible for the artwork. In other words, fidelity is not only impossible to achieve, but also undesirable when it comes to a film adaptation. Because cinema is a multi-track medium that requires decisions made by a number of people. While fidelity approach sees the filmic adaptation as a supplement of the literary text in a new art, in reality, adaptation as a practice suggests multiple contexts, therefore multiple authors. Another problem with fidelity discourse is that it assumes the translation of the text to a new medium somehow alters and damages the original, where in fact nothing even touches the source text while adapting it. Novelist Raymond Chandler was asked how he felt about what Hollywood had done to his novels. He responded, my novels? Why, Hollywood hasn't done anything to them. They're still right there on the shelf. And this is indeed the case. An adaptation is a new formation, completely independent from the source text. No adaptation, no matter how faithful it claims to be, can be turned back, reversed to create the source material exactly. It will always be a different creation. This might assert the superiority of the source over the adaptation, but at the same time it suggests the freedom of the adaptation from the source, for it can choose to relocate whatever element it deems appropriate. When a literary work is adapted into a film, the adaptation becomes a different thing, just like a historical painting becomes a different thing from the historical event it illustrates. An adaptation is not a supplement for, nor it is the equivalent of, the source text, for they are created by different people, with different backgrounds, under different circumstances, with different tools. This does not mean one medium of expression or product is necessarily better than the other. Each creation has its unique properties that distinguishes it from the other, therefore claiming one is better is meaningless. Art is not the imitation of nature, but rather of other arts. The creation of a film happens because of the influence of the existence of other films, books and paintings. Arts are in intertextual dialogue constantly throughout history. To think of a work of art free of any bond or connection is impossible. Adaptation in this sense is a typical hybrid construction, blending not only two different art forms, but the artistic expressions of countless artists all around the same story.
Complete originality in art is neither possible nor desirable, because originality in literature is unattainable. Betraying that originality through an unfaithful adaptation is ridiculous. Instead of focusing on formal similarities and differences, or fidelity of the adaptation to the source material, the analysis should be focused around the thematic analysis, and how a new artist handles the same theme in the light of a new medium. Adaptation is an artistic expression, not a rereading or a rewriting, but a reappearance of a component, a theme that simply appeared elsewhere before. Whether the reappearance resembles the earlier creation is not relevant at this point, for the new creation happens in a different time and space. What matters is not the fidelity in the form or in the context of the earlier work, but the adaptation status as a whole in the new medium. Thanks for watching.